Welcome to Minor Details. I'm Nick. And I'm James. And we are two industrial designers in the big city. Sweating the small stuff. Um, we're back. We are back. Took a little week break, but uh, bet- glad, glad to be back. Hi, yeah. How you been? I've been good. You were in LA. I was in Los Angeles. How was uh, the sunny LA? It was... It was actually colder than it is here, which was funny. Oh, that's interesting. And they're, they've gotten a lot of rain this season, so there's a lot more I feel like vegetation. LA, I feel like LA doesn't get rain. It, Isn't it, it just always sunny? Always perfect? It's always sunny in Philadelphia. Mm. But in Los Angeles, uh, they've actually been getting a lot more rain this year. So there's like a lot of vegetation, which is, it's kind of rare. And it's kind of cool. Mm. Like, there's just a lot of flowers blooming everywhere you were just hanging out with your family over there yeah we got some um, my wife's got some siblings out there i saw you went to disneyland oh we went to disneyland and let me tell you i walked out of there with some sweet swag i saw that it was like a hype beast disneyland shirt oh my god i was so hype um disneyland uh i guess t-shirt you're gonna have to send a 50th we'll we'll definitely have to send a photo yes put it on the put it on the i think it's the 50th anniversary it kind of looked like uh, the Life of Pablo shirt. Yes, if exactly. Familiar, if, if you're familiar with that. Which uh, I'm like, what Pablo head is working insider at Disney? Yeah. And and what? It was like it had Disneyland. Oh, there it is. There it is. It's a sweater, Disneyland on the back, but it was like in a in a half circle yeah, shape it's or got something. A, it, has a big, <laughs> it has a big D. Yeah. <laughs> The Disney, the, front, D, the Disney the D. Disney D. The Disney D. And then um and then established in nineteen fifty five. And then on the back it's got the big oh, yeah, Disneyland. That is so which, hype. We're looking at it right now. Oh, it's so nice. Uh yeah. I and I think I I don't know if they still use this particular logo for Disneyland. This is like a retro logo. I love that. It's like a calligraphy type font. Yeah. I've never been a fan of the Disney like the the, the logo the writing because lo- it's very like script it yeah. looks to me that d looks like a g it, it's very it's confusing. like a backwards g yeah, for sure. and i so i read it in a way that's inappropriate for podcast <laughs> for for our clean cut podcast yeah we, we only i have to put the uh, a, dis- a disclaimer on the front i, if we start I hope i never push you to put that <laughs> disclaimer on there um oh, man. but uh one of the things that i took with me to la and something that my wife found for us yeah you're talking to me about this today oh, James. Man, i, I, I kind of want to look at this thing. i was trying to sell you hard on this bowie i i think that's how you pronounce the name of the company bowie usa they they do these uh i don't know if they're silicone or just or just a rubber um it says bpa free antimicrobial material so, so this is a shower scrub it's a shower that, scrub that you took on vacation with you that's how good it is it's <laughs> it's so it's amazing so i don't know like, i don't know many people that take shower scrubs you can't with them. you can't take your like loofah or whatever that n- yeah, yeah, yeah. netted crap is yeah. you can't take that on a vacation it takes at least like three days to dry right and so this thing is just you know this rubber th- this rubber piece it's it's circular and it has all these little scrubby fingers oh yeah it's it's like silicone or something and then it has these three holes that you can put your fingers through for a grip okay and it's it's amazing it's changing my life i i swear you should smell me sometime Mm, i don't want to do that but uh, i mean i'll I'll take your word for it i'll get closer if you need (laughs) me to but it's uh it's an amazing scrub brush and it dries very quickly and the other cool thing they're showing right now is you can just stick it to your shower wall and it just stays there. That is see I never think about scrub brushes. Mm-hmm. I mean I have my I've had my loofah for like I don't know 5 years now. Yeah. It's not it's not looking too good. <laughs> it's definitely Yeah, you need to replace it. But this thing I think loofahs you're supposed to replace like once a month. I oh, think this sh- thing you're supposed to replace like once every 3 months. No. Um and it's this, this thing definitely looks like a 10 year loofah. <laughs> <laughs> At my rate you for sure. You can this all right here is a built-in family heirloom. You can <laughs> You can pass on to your children and their children, and I think I think this is made in the USA. I mean, it says USA, um, but I first knew about this company because they do this toothbrush, Ooh, a really cool. nice toothbrush, toothbrush yeah. that has a replaceable head, which okay. is also the same kind of rubbery material. It's, it's all the rage it's nowadays. It's not. 
I no, I was not, not as not impressed okay. with this <laughs> as I was with the uh, with the scrubber. Well, um, well, we were kind of talking about this uh, or just earlier. How there are items in our life where th- they are they are such a good design that we almost care for them more. Yeah, and it it feels like it's worth it to like purchase something that you want to care for and use every day. Yeah. Especially yeah. something that's like so mundane that you don't really think about. Right. But once you buy it, you, it changes your whole life. Right. Cause we were thinking, we were just talking about the blunt umbrella, uh, which is essentially the best design umbrella out there. Yeah. Really the only design. There's probably a few other designs there's, umbrellas out there. There's one other one that's kind of cool that like flips inside out so that it kind of like catches all the water. It feels like a gimmick, but it also seems kind of yeah. cool. All right. James is about to open up my umbrella, his umbrella in my room. Yes. And this is all the bad luck. Oh, it's wet. Oh, no. That's LA water. Uh, <laughs> that's water from LA? Yeah, baby. Uh, so, yeah, this, I, the thing is, is that whenever I. Whenever I see somebody that I haven't told about this umbrella and I have it on me, I'm like, you gotta, you gotta just press the button. Yeah, well, it because doesn't matter where it's it is. So satisfying. Yeah. It's like that's it, really nice. It has. I, I don't know how you describe the effect. It's of got it. a feel to it. I bet they worked really hard to get that feel just right. It's beautiful. And the unique. So the unique thing about the blunt umbrella, the reason why it's called a blunt umbrella, is because at the edges are blunt yes they're so they're rounded off that if you hit somebody with it you don't poke their eye out you don't poke their eye out which and is which is definitely important in new york because it there's because a lot of umbrellas in new york and there's and there's a, a lot of people with eye patches yes <laughs> um because of uh umbrellas that are not so blunt right i can smell the yeah the it's musk. very dewy i can smell the musk on uh, that it's very uh sorry you about mill dewy you should let it dry out i know i know i always just put it in the sleeve and forget it set it and forget it but oh, anyway man. enough enough sale sales uh, a, new, a new another product that we just got as well oh um, yeah weekly update is the oculus quest and uh, if you didn't notice, we were actually wearing Oculus Quest the entire time during the first <laughs> segment of the podcast. I'm just kidding. We weren't. But uh, um, yeah, you, we both got Oculus Quest and we both had a, have had a chance to try out the beta version of Gravity Sketch. Oh, yeah. James, first impressions? It's pretty great. I mean, here's the thing. I'm total newbie to the Oculus to the gravity sketch world right i haven't really played with it much and this is vr sketching yeah. for those who aren't familiar. so i feel like when you first get into a program like that you're you're normally you're like doing things that are just completely meaningless because you're exploring <laughs> the different right tools it's like scribbling like a child yeah, yeah absolutely so i'm i'm excited to try it out on something a bit more serious and and design focused yeah but uh i i Nick, you're a more experienced user of the Gravity Sketch program. Yeah. When, How do you feel about when it? When I tried Gravity Sketch on the Oculus Quest, I cried. I cried for an and hour. you broke your Oculus Quest. It filled up with water. <laughs> it doesn't work anymore. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's amazing. I got to say, um, it's all I had dreamed of. Yeah. The only other aspect of the dream, which is I, I can or cannot confirm, is uh, group sketching. I want to be able to sketch with you, James, oh, yeah. across the country or across the world Whoa. or across the neighborhood. That'll be wild. Uh, cannot can or cannot confirm that. So, uh, yeah, hopefully that'll come one day. Yeah. And uh, I I also got to give props to the Oculus design team and just the Oculus team in general. This thing is a feat of engineering. Yeah. To cram all the computing power and you know tracking power into just a standalone headset is amazing yeah it just is the headset with two controllers it is beautifully designed yes. i have to say uh beautifully engineered i mean you know the thing that i first interacted with is there's a spacer in here for for somebody with glasses and the way the way that it just like clicks in and out it's very nice. It's so nice. It's very nice. I mean, the hardware just right off the bat was impressive to me. Yeah. And um, yeah, it's uh, and I have to say, given that this is my my first VR headset, and I got I went through all the demos. Yeah. I was I was like dancing with this robot, <laughs> and I started to get feelings. I started to catch some feelings oh, for this boy. robot. Shit. <laughs> um, but it's so much fun. Like just the demos themselves, I was like, okay, I'm sold. Like this was yeah. worth the money already. Yeah. So yeah, I th- I'm I, looking forward to. I would definitely say, for in my opinion, if you have never gotten into VR and you're thinking about it, 
this is a great entry level device. Um, We're such salesmen today. Uh, <laughs> we are not sponsored by any of these companies. Well, you we haven't even talked about our pins yet, but we'll we got we got there, more we got more things to sell you guys. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, and yeah, I mean, we we know a few of the people that worked on it. Uh, Mauricio Romano, I believe. I don't think he worked. I think. No? I, I I messaged. I think I messaged Did him message and said him? congrats. And I I think I don't think that he worked on this particular. Okay. One. Well, he does work at Oculus. Yes. So maybe next year we'll see his. Yeah. Something from but him. we know Zarki worked on the rendering. Yes. And... Tim Zarki uh, does amazing renderings, and his renderings of this Oculus Quest was on stage with Mark Zuckerberg, which is pretty cool. Yeah. It's pretty cool. Very cool. Um, yeah. Check out the Oculus Quest, guys. I want to get. We should have a VR podcast one day, you know. That would be sweet in front of in front of a VR audience. Um, but yeah, moving on to our next oh, piece of oh yes, next product to yes, sell you guys. This is, <laughs> this this is, is the QVC. This is the minor details pin. Um, yes, it's a little asterisk. I think we promoted it a few weeks ago on a podcast. And shout out to everyone that's ordered one. We yeah. had a few orders come in, so yeah. super excited to see that. Um, but yeah, we still have some left get one uh, minor details podcast.com yeah it's a great way to support the podcast if you enjoyed it if we've given back to you mm-hmm. yeah yeah i mean the the thing about this is so you know obviously nick and i work work jobs and so in order to do the podcast we're kind of taking time out of either our professional lives or our personal lives right and so anything that you can do to help support us in you know like we would love to be able to do more things with the podcast for and sure. focus more time for sure. on it and the quality. Uh, and that can only be achieved if we, uh, yes. If... Cur- currently the podcast makes negative dollars <laughs> and maybe selling a few pins would m- break even. Yes. So, so yeah. Uh, if you can find it in your heart and in your wallet to get a minor details yeah. pin, it looks sweet and you yeah. can spin it too. Yeah. Little fidget spinner. You can just keep it on this card here and use it as a, a fidget. Yeah. But uh but yeah, thank you to those who have already purchased and uh to those who will yeah, purchase. For sure. Thanks guys. Um boop, 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 design news. Design news. Um this week we saw an article about Bose that uh, the headline says Bose headphones have been spying on customers. This is from uh, the Washington Post. Yeah, uh, it might be a little bit of a uh, clickbait, clickbait for sure. But I think it's kind of an interesting topic. Yeah. So it, it, apparently, what the lawsuit claims is that there's there's this app that goes along with the headset. Right. You know, Bose sells the headsets. Yeah. You know, the headphones, and they're like, oh, hey, you can get the Bose app. And you can probably like adjust a few like details and kind of get the most out of your your headset. Yeah, I think I think maybe par- partially it's for control without having to interact with the headset. But what the lawsuit is claiming is that through the app they are collecting data on what you're listening to, and then selling right. that data to third parties. Um, so you know this is not an uncommon sort of theme during our time right now in the modern era of companies taking you know what we consider to be private and selling it to third parties i mean yeah i mean literally every app that you download has some some sort of data collection right thing um and i i think maybe some of the the uh, uh i guess problem with with the bose thing was they were recording what people were listening to right and allegedly 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 and then you know you can associate a lot by what someone listens to right you know whether it's a podcast or it could be you know uh, a religious or political yeah affiliation um or all about my little ponies yeah i don't mm-hmm. know i we don't judge um yeah i'm and and uh the interesting one of the interesting things in this article is like the person who's who's mounting the lawsuit it like has not clarified how exactly they figured it out so mm. like that's a piece of it where the where you know it's still to be determined yeah it's still to be determined for sure um but it's funny because i i kind of i kind of wanted to talk about bose headphones because one of our 
our last podcast, we were talking about your idea of familiar ideas right. or familiar products right. and how they attain famous status. Right. And um, the thing that I've always thought about Bose headphones, first of all, the first thought that I ever had about Bose headphones leaving college was that I absolutely hated Bose headphones. <laughs> I've always thought Bose headphones are very dad marketed yeah it's it's very much a quality like oh we all we focus on is sound quality so you're saying these are dad these are like the dad shoes of headphones yes i definitely believe that interesting i I think they're gonna make a comeback but the thing the thing that i always feel about them or the thing that i feel about them now is that to me they're almost i see them all the time and everywhere and to me they're it's not necessarily that i see them all the time and i'm like oh now i appreciate the the, the design they just kind of it's kind of like a paper clip to me at this mm, point it's, it's like this thing that's just there and it exists the thing that i always really didn't like about them and this is something that i that i garnered during my first job was the dislike of the shape of the headphone because it's it's just an like oval. it's a straight up like ellipse. Yes. And I don't know if you've had this feeling, but when you know how easy it is to make something in SolidWorks or like how you would just like use the ellipse tool like to create that shape cuz cuz well, the thing the thing I know that it's there's more to that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's okay. more to it than that. Okay. But that's what it like that's what the root of the design feels like to me is just like the ellipse and then a connector. That's true. I don't and know if that necessarily equates it to bad design. No. But I, I see what you're saying. I but see what you're saying. It's it's something that at my first job I saw a lot of like when people were creating product products that had hang holes on them. Yeah. Like the way that people would often do it to add like a little bit of flair was to make an ellipse. And like I just always thought that that was like a cop out. It was a cop out. And then I also felt like if you're going to put a hole there, like why not just put a circle? Like why not just make it a circle? Like I try to like make it pretty. It's just yeah. Not, not try to like add this little bit of flair and try to deceive, deceive the public. But interestingly, Bose just came out with a new set of headphones that are like, totally. What are these called? The Bose 700s. Okay. They're totally this different. Is, this is complete opposite of the dad. Radical that, departure. The, the classic dad Bose headphones. I mean, this is like, it has the, I don't know what you call this thing that goes over your top of your head, the support? Uh, yes. Kind of. The head, the headgear. Yeah, it kind of starts off with the, a lofted headgear of like a half, <laughs> half semicircle and then uh, lofts to a full. It almost looks kind like of, the padding is on the top of the headphone. It which, does. That's kind of which, odd. Confuse, which is confusing, but it looks like there it is fabric underneath here. The headphones are still oval. They definitely have more of a volcano shape. Yeah, to, they got that volcano. It's, it's a volcano to a circle. It is a volcano to a circle. And the and circle kind of hugs around. The, right. The And the headgear comes down and it's just like kind of a post yeah. like, that, that intersects the circle, the volcano. And thoughts. My thought is that, that this is like, I while I think the design in in isolation is really nice, it feels way too foreign to Bose. I I do yeah that that makes sense. Like looking at it, it looks really cool. I don't necessarily know. Like I mean, maybe there's some nuances to it that I don't know about. But yeah, it doesn't really feel like Bose. Like to me, if I saw this and you didn't tell me what the brand was, I would assume it was a Sony. Mm, I can I can see that. And I don't know if that if that's what Bose is going for. Well, the, well, the interesting thing about this is like what you're saying with the familiar, you know, the familiar idea of hey, I've seen it a million times, I know it, I'm more likely to buy a classic Bose because that's what I are familiar with. This thing is going the opposite direction, right? Or even even to my like idea of like if Bose is the dad shoes of headphones, yeah, and if those are going to come back and trend maybe they are actually falling out of trend by going with a newer design. Right. That's, that is interesting. I, yeah, I would be interested to know. I mean, I can see it. I, they... can, I can see someone that's like very norm core yeah. wanting just a classic pair of bows. Right. Right. I, I would be interested to know how this project went down. What the, what the purpose of it was. We had a listener that entered the bows. Remember that? Really? I think so. We should, we should contact them. Cause the other thing that I will say about these is, 
kudos to the industrial designer who convinced Bose to make right. these because right. that would be real. I feel like that would be a hard task. It almost feels like there might have been some leadership change to get right. these these headphones involved. Yeah, some somebody the... who who was not a dad. They were <laughs> they were specifically non dad, and they were like. We got to get rid of this barbecue, <laughs> lawn mowing, <laughs> headphone culture that we have around here. And we need to appeal to, I don't know what kind of market this is. This, yeah. this feels like some molly popping. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't even know. Like That's interesting. Club, club fairing kids. But uh, anyway. Um. Another design news thing. I don't know if you want to talk oh, about yeah. it. Oh, yeah. Playdate. Yeah. So there was this, uh, I guess, I, I believe it's a, what, software company that had this idea, and they collaborated with Teenage Engineering to yeah. create it, and it is a new handheld gaming device. Mm-hmm. Um, priced pretty low. I think it was like estimated at 150 It's called Playdate, um, and I mean... I gotta say, teenage engineering always kills it with the design. Yeah, it's beautiful. I know it's v- very functionally designed. It's great. I the so the company the company that did it. Um, oh, it's called, it's Panic. called Panic. Yes, and they did this game called Firewatch, which I've never played, but I've heard is an amazing game. I've seen I've seen some let's plays of this one. Um, you're you're out there watching those let's plays. I used to be a lot more involved, but now. I- <laughs> I, I don't really. Oh no, it. there's nudity. All right, okay. oh, James, turn it off. Turn it off. <laughs> we're going to put the we're going to put the explicit warning on this. I'm podcast. just putting I'm just putting up some screens. It's I, I've heard it's a really beautiful game to play, but yeah, they're going with this kind of. I couldn't tell. Is this so? Is the idea that this is like open source? The I, I believe the idea from what I've read is that this software slash game company is going to open this up to indie developers to develop yeah. very like fun uh simple games that can run on this handheld device it's it's like simple black and white screen it's a little square yeah um and i think they're going to release a new game every week on more of a subscription basis oh that's which cool. is kind of a unique way yeah to release games well the uh, and then they have this uh which apparently according to what i read this is like teenage engineering's innovation with this device is this crank and and I gotta say this is like the most iconic thing about this device. It has yeah, some sort of cranking system. Yeah. That at first glance I was like, wait, is this power the device? Like, it kind of reminds me of those like handheld uh, flashlights where you crank. Right. Them. That's what I thought as well. But it's for the gameplay, so you can crank your game, and you know whatever developer chooses to use as that input is you know uh, interacted with your game. Yeah, I've I've lost I've lost the website. That's fine. That's I think uh, we can talk about it. <laughs> it... <laughs> Here we go. I got it back up. But yeah, anyway, the, um, I think it's a beautiful design. I'm really interested to see what it's like. Yeah, I the thing. Are that you gonna I, get one? If it's that cheap, I have a bunch of teenage engineering stuff. Yeah, and it's basically just in my design museum right. collection. It, it's all, it feels like a design museum object. Yeah. And it, it honestly feels like anything teenage engineering makes is like a design yeah. object. I mean, it's 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 just so it's one of those beautiful. things that's like that's hype from the start and then just ages well. Yeah. Um but yeah, I I, I am curious with this crank on the side how comfortable gameplay will be. Yeah. I mean, I guess you could just fold it up and play. You can see some good fishing games with that crank. Oh yeah, <laughs> that would be pretty cool. So um, yeah, I think uh, I'm I'm really excited. I signed up for the uh, tell me when it's out list. Yeah, yeah. Um, we'll link to it. We'll link to it. Um, but yeah, uh, this week we kind of left out a weekly update. And it's a big weekly update. Design week. Design week. So we want to talk it about... came and went. It came and went. Um, yeah, for, for those who aren't familiar, design week is the big design. Uh, it's more of like two weeks, honestly, yeah. in New York City where you know all the furniture companies come and they show off their new furniture pieces, as well as a, a lot of other design companies. Yeah. Uh, but I would say generally it focuses on like furniture and houseware. Right. 
Uh, but there was a lot of other cool events that we went to. Yeah. I don't know if what you had. Yeah, well, you know, my my friends, Oscar Salguero and, and Goen Choi, they were part of the group hug. Group hug. Mm-hmm. Um, Little ex- exhibition. Exhibit. And uh, that was all about... Um, it was a lot to do with sustainability. Sustainability, but also almost in an apocalyptic way yeah from what i can recall yeah it was kind of i i really enjoyed their project because they it was more of a a, i don't know what you call it theoretical project where they're we we like to harvest energy from the sun the wind all these you know huge sources of energy yeah uh but their project was about how do we harvest energy from the tiny moments in life where energy is present. So yeah. they focused on plant life and insect life. And so like harvesting the energy from bee, like the butterfly wings or like the, yeah. bee, the bees vibrations. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to, I'm trying to find it. I, I feel like I have images. I'll just put them in there. Yeah, but yeah, but yeah, I, I thought that was really interesting that, that thinking differently about the scales yeah. of and, of energy that we're collecting from the environment. And then, and there was one that was, they, they designed what little like twigs that pl- uh, ants can crawl on and yeah. the vibrations of the ants footsteps <laughs> would harvest the energy. Yeah. It's, it's pretty cool. I, and I like, that's the general like spirit of, uh, of the projects at group hug is it's speculative. Yeah. Speculative. That's what I was thinking. Of. Yeah, yeah. It's uh you know, experimental, right. really interesting, but they, they did have, one uh, device there, I think that one of the founders of Group Hug made, which was this this frame that had solar panels, but the solar panels were kind of arranged in a way that was like pattern like, mm, okay. and and made them aesthetic. But the idea was to like hang it uh, onto your window oh, to like collect right, right, right. the sun, right. and then it could charge your phone. But it still had the clear part, so you could still get sunlight through your window, yeah. right? So. Um, yeah, that was cool. And then we both went to the visibility. Yeah, visibility under, Des- under the office. Their design, their design studio. I'm a I'm a big fan of them. And, and my my opinion, I thought they had the best show. Mm-hmm. I really enjoyed seeing all of their prototypes and a lot of their work. Um, and I think it's nice. To, it, it was nice also because they work on stuff that's also beyond furniture. Um, yeah, you know, there's there's the big there's the big show of ICFF, the International Contemporary Furniture Fair, which is just a bunch a bunch of chairs. You know, yeah. it's just like at some point you kind of become uh, numb to it. Yeah. But I liked seeing visibilities work because, you know, they had some of their appliances in there and, and some other kind of unique objects. Yeah, and a lot of um, prototypes and, like you were saying, like one-offs. Mm-hmm. Um, and, so, you know, some of them haven't been made weren't made um yeah it's it's kind of fun to see the the stuff that didn't make it yeah because not a lot of people talk about the 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 stuff that you don't see you know yeah but i i really appreciate their work there's there's kind of a a, like a sense of humor a subtle win a whimsy Mm -hmm. to a lot of their projects and i feel like they're they're also sort of in the Jamie Wolfallen camp of mm-hmm. being sort of manufacturing led, yeah, manufacturing driven. I mean, the one thing that I was thinking about when you think about whimsical, they had this uh, flashlight that was like a simple. It was like if you cut off the top of a walking cane, yeah, and then added a like a, a cone on the bottom to create the flashlight. It looked like it looked like a faucet. It looked it definitely you, did not look like a flashlight when you looked at it. I was like, what is this object? And then you picked it up and I was like, oh. It's a flashlight. Yeah, I'm trying to find. I'm trying to find it. There's some handles on here up here. Oh yeah, there's the handles, but it's yeah, it's back. It's back in the corner here. Um, but yeah, pretty cool. Pretty cool design. Um, and the guys were were great, very welcoming. Um, and uh, so Nick, we haven't talked about Jasper Morrison. Oh yes, I <laughs> I got to meet Jasper Morrison. Uh, I, I will say meat as a, a very light term. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Jasper, Jasper Morrison, famous industrial designer had a exhibition for his cork furniture. Yeah. Um, it's just solid furniture made out of cork. Um, and I went to his opening and there he was, he was standing in there. And I gotta say, I do reference Jasper Morrison quite a bit because I read one of his books, uh, 
a book of things it's called uh-huh. and it definitely really helped me refine my design language um just helping me understand that sometimes you have to let design be and not mess it up with, mm. with all your you know extra doohickeys and emotions right yeah just let it be yeah um but yeah, I just was like, should I say hey to him? Should I say hey to him? Of course, at these design events, there's everyone is thinking the exact same thing, right? Right. Everyone's over there kind of like, oh, should I slip in there and say hey? Um, so I was with my friend Chris. And, it's like a middle school dance. Yeah, right. Exactly. And, you know, I was like, okay, I've I've been here for an hour now, just kind of waiting for my time. Yeah. I think I'm just going to go for it. So I walk over there and he's talking to some people, right? And I just kind of stand there awkwardly and we kind of make eye contact halfway through <laughs> the other people's conversation, Ooh. you know, like five minutes in. And, yeah. and I was like, oh, hey. And he kind of talked to them again. And I was like, oh, no, this is so weird. <laughs> but um, yeah, I, I eventually just went for it. I was I just interrupted. I was like, I, I have to, you know, I'm, yeah. I'm about to leave. Um, yeah. And so, I, you know, I just said, hey, I'm, I'm heading out, Jasper Morrison. I just wanted to... <laughs> I just wanted to... Hey, Jasper, I'm heading out. I'll see you later. I'll see you later. Don't worry I'll about it. I'll catch you. I'll catch you another time. <laughs> um, no, this is definitely a very awkward Nick, like very like starstruck Nick. But I just was like, hey, you know, thank you so much for your... Uh, I can see the terror in your eyes. It, the terror in my eyes and also Jasper's eyes. He's, he's like... He's definitely scared of, of He's like, all my right, enthusiasm. you can go now. <laughs> um, but yeah, I... Uh, you know, I just was like, hey, thank you so much for your work. You know, I, I take a lot of inspiration from you. I read your book. Um, and he didn't say much. He just said, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm pretty sure he only said, yeah. Because I was like, at the end, I was like, hey, can I take a photo with you? And he's like, yeah. We took a photo. And I was like, see you later. And he's like, yeah. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, that was my interaction with him. You, it Nick, wasn't you, as insightful Nick, as, you gotta, as the Rams. You got to ask questions. That are open ended. Yes, I was. I was very well. Also, yeah, this was like early. Listen, in the day. I'm not going to coach you when it comes to because uh, I get starstruck. Yeah. Uh, famously, went up to one of my musical heroes, Britt Daniel of Spoon, and uh, I've never heard of either of those people. Oh well. Well, Spoon I'll, is a I thing. Will, I will enlighten you. Okay. Um, you like minimalism, right? They're a great minimal band. Oh, interesting. Uh, but. Uh, yeah, I, I was in line to get to get a CD signed, and I finally got to the front, and I was like ready to just like totally pal out with this guy, right. become best friends, right. and I took a deep breath and just, hi, and <laughs> that was it. And he just wrote, hi, Britt Daniel, pass it to the next band member, and that was it. So anyway. Oh, wow. Yeah, I, I I don't do well in those situations either. Um, I mean, I'm glad I did it. Like, yeah, at, at least I tried. And maybe next time I see him, I mean, he won't remember me. You'll but will be like, I'll, yeah. But I'll be more comfortable for sure. I think. Yeah. And I'll think of a good question to ask. Him. Yeah. I just was not prepared. I did not know he's going to be at this event. Yeah. Um, be like, why is your name Jasper Morrison? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's not a good question. <laughs> why, Jasper? <laughs> um. I guess a design week for me, I had my weight weight in the oh yeah in the Times Square. We went and saw that. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was completely broken. I mean, to be fair, it was my prototype, and they put it in Times Square. It was going to happen. Yeah. I kind of expected it to happen. It was about time. It was about time. Um, and I think we talked about that. We talked about the weight weight. That's so funny that your weight weight was in Times Square. Did you not make that connection? I did not until now. <laughs> That's amazing, James. That's beautiful. Um, but the big thing that I, I released was my, uh, almost object ball opener, the spin ball opener. Oh yeah. We talked about it on the the podcast before design week, but, uh, I did a little scavenger hunt. So I saw that, you know, I teased it uh, on the podcast previously, but, um, I put a bunch of ball openers in, electrical conduit boxes yeah that i printed out like 3d printed out yeah and and i pinned them up on telephone poles around the city um it was it was fun it was exciting uh i put out five and then i put the coordinates up on my uh almost object instagram Mm -hmm. and then i i think 
within like five hours they had been collected it was so fun to like see people collect one yeah and you know send me a photo of it the fun thing was there's one uh bottle opener that i put next to the electrical company and when someone went to find it it was gone but it wasn't unscrewed and no one had sent me any images right and so i can only assume that someone from the electrical company saw it on a telephone pole and was like oh i'm an electrician i know that that doesn't go there (laughs) and so they just ripped it off but the beautiful part about it and this is the poetic part is that they found this object inside and they have no clue what it is yeah so it's an almost object that's funny and also, those tabs that were ripped off are still on that telephone yes, pole. Yes, for sure. Um, so that was fun. Yeah. And yeah, I released, you know, kind of just, you know, released it to the public, opened up my website, almostobject.com, to be able to purchase one. Mm-hmm. And if you're listening right now, you can go there and buy one if you'd like. Um, and yeah, I, I am super excited. I've sold a lot. Um, so I don't know. It's, it's, it's fun to like, Finish something and release it and have people go get it. Yeah. So that's awesome. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know what other thoughts we had on design week. Um, I thought it was a little bit smaller this year than it had been in the past. Yeah. I mean, I, I would say that I didn't make it out to as many events as I have in years past. My dad came. Oh yeah. Just coincidentally, he was flying through for a business trip. Yeah. He went to the frog party. We were at the frog party. Right. They had a, a bunch of their old uh, designs. Like, I think about, like, the next computer that Steve Jobs had his little right. interim yeah. with, uh, which is just a solid black cube. Right. Um, it's a really unique design. Um, Doesn't it have... Does it have 90 degree angles? So, I, I believe the story behind this this computer, it's a solid black cube, is that... From what I can remember, I believe this was coming from one of the Steve Jobs movies, but mm-hmm. Steve Jobs was saying, hey, it doesn't. It, we want it to look like a perfect cube. Right. But in order for it to look like a perfect cube visually, you actually have to make it not a perfect cube. Right. It has to be shorter on one end so that the foreshortened effect doesn't, uh, right. doesn't like throw it off. And that's, that's something that I, I often talk about the... Uh, the gr- the Greek and Roman columns. Oh right, because how, how they bow out. In yeah, center. they bow out in the middle so that they look straight from a distance. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's it's a super interesting computer. I mean, that's a, that's a, kind of a unique uh, thing to talk about is like the fact that a lot of times something can be perfect dimensionally, but visually it is not. Right. Yeah, it is. It is interesting, and I mean that's the value of prototyping. Mm-hmm. is like you're never you're not going to find out until you see it because like solidworks will deceive you all day right for sure um yeah that was a fun party and and uh, I, I do i do kind of wish they had the last year they did the exhibition with the skateboards right. and then before that they did the dart exhibition this year i don't think they i guess it was their 50 anniversary so they wanted to do more of an anniversary party yeah but yeah that was i i i do have to say that i think i enjoyed the years previous right. at, at frog but but it was cool to see all this stuff i missed the the talk with hartman he just yeah he bolted the right founder after. of frog was there yeah. yeah um and then oh gosh i went to icff of course icff you have to you kind of have to go it right. like it's like the book it almost feels it's the flagship i was saying i I was saying it almost feels like an obligation. Like yeah. it almost feels like okay, I gotta go. I gotta go I to ICF. Gotta go, I guess, yeah, yeah. Um, but I met up with my friend Dylan Mellinger, uh, who is uh, Black Fox Furniture. Okay. Was um, he, did he have a little booth there? He or? did not have a booth there, but we just we walked around okay. and checked it out. It's always good to check out ICFF with a friend because otherwise it can get a little monotonous. Yeah. You can also um, discuss the things that you're seeing. Terry Crews was there. Yeah, Terry Crews, avid industrial designer, uh, and and uh, I guess he's an actor or something. He he was he's an actor. I think he might have been a football, yeah, NFL player. He's um, the guy from Old Spice commercials, right? Yes, he is. But I think I think he went to school for industrial design. Di- for industrial design or for architecture? Oh, I don't know. Uh, scholarship at the Interlochen Center of the Arts. He definitely went to art school. Yeah. 
but yeah, he works with a a, a new fur. Uh, what's it called? I can't remember the furniture company, but he you know is is a designer. See, yeah. he, he he's designed uh, furniture in the past for this company as well. Um, um, but yeah, Bernhardt Bernhardt is the furniture company. Yes. So his his, his furniture is nice. Again, it's like you see all this furniture and you just kind of become numb to it. It's like, yes. It was like our it's like our podcast we talked about recently with the famous design. It's like what makes Terry Crews' furniture better than you know Jasper Morrison's furniture? Like it's it's all good. Yeah, we're gonna have to touch back on that on that topic the uh, the familiar topic. Yeah. Um, because there was there was some conversation in the Discord that I think was was really productive in terms of sort of like sifting through what we were saying. And I think Dave Joseph, I think he made the the best distinction was that there's, there's a difference between famous design and iconic design. Yes. Yes. That was a good point to make. Yeah. Because famous design is something that, you know, everyone's, you know, it's a, it's a famous design and everyone's familiar with it, but iconic design is different because it's, fame over a long period of time yeah is that what it was kind of equated i to? think yeah fa- like uh, the way the way that i was doing it was kind of like through music analogies yeah so i feel like there's there's famous design which is kind of like your top 40 hits yeah but then there's iconic design which is like the beatles right. number one hits you right. know the 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 songs that we all know that have lasted so long because they still have they still have utility and re- relevance even in the the modern day. Yeah. Um but yeah. So yeah, any closing thoughts on D- Design Week? Yeah, you know, I was walking around Design Week looking at all this stuff and it just made me feel like I the thing the thing is is that it is it can be fun to go around and look at these objects, but the thing that I kept feeling was oh, man, I really need to be more a part of this i need to have something here which is why i you know i applaud that you did this bottle opener around design week because at least you were participating in it you weren't just a passive observer yeah i I will also say like it doesn't i feel like a lot of times people think that oh i have to go and be in in this exhibition this big show like icff or whatever and have this booth right but like just like it's fun to just like post something on Instagram and yeah. say like it's part of design week or something, right. you know? Yeah. And I feel like that, that seems to be more of like what you did is more the spirit of like Milan design week. I feel like there's a lot of that kind of stuff going on there. Mm. Um, and I think New York design week kind of hasn't figured out what it is yet. Like it still feels like it's, yeah, it's, I can see that. There's not sort of like a unifying thing right. about it. And, but the thing that I do love about Design Week is seeing all of my design friends in one place. It's, it's like design parties every single night. Yeah, yeah. but it, th- that in itself can be also pretty exhausting. <laughs> For sure. And For sure. you will need the next week. <laughs> the next week is called Recover Week. Recover Week. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, so those are my closing thoughts. Do you have any closing thoughts on Design Week? I think. I mean, I, I you know, I think. I'm really happy with how the bottle opener turned out. Yeah. Um, going to be shipping out soon. So look for that in your mailbox. Um, and yeah, I thought it was definitely a fun week. I think it was a little smaller than previous weeks. Also, it's a little bit different now, like living in New York. Right. I think my, my first design week was um, I had traveled from Texas up to New York right. just for design week. Right. And so it was a little bit more magical in the sense that, oh, it's New York too. It's like design week <laughs> and New York. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, it was it was overall good, good design week. Um, but yeah, I'll have to get ready for next year then. Cool. All right, so um, we we are not doing a topic this week because we well our topic was design week. Well, yeah, I guess so. So we've but we have some questions to catch up on. Yeah, well, what's our first question, James? Oh, we didn't have any voicemails. We or, did. or we, I don't know. We haven't done the podcast in a while, so I'm I'm getting a little rusty. But. Uh, if you have a if you have a, a voicemail that you'd like to send in, or if you sent one in, I think there was one voicemail that got cut off. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, send it to. Oh shoot! I one know. four nine. F- wait. Oh man. Yeah, we wait. are definitely rusty. Oh my gosh. F- yeah. One six four six four nine four forty eleven. Yes. Thanks, James. Um, we need some sort of. If anybody out there has a barbershop quartet or a <laughs> doo-wop group, 
uh, we would appreciate if you made a jingle for the phone number. We'll splice it in. Um, but the first question comes from Ezra, and they ask, I was reading a Core 77 article by Paul Sohi, a uh, person we've interviewed on the Minor Details podcast, where he talks about time management skills and crunch time. I thought maybe you could share your insights on the subject, especially how your time management skills have evolved from being a student to a professional. I think that's a good question. I I also think, just to preface, the the article was about kind of staying up late in the studio and working really hard and almost burning out, Mm -hmm. but also the fact that that's not the right way to do things, that we really should be taking breaks and things like that. And that was was Paul's article. That was his point of view. and yeah, I mean, it's definitely an interesting topic. I definitely think there's some value to taking breaks for sure. I talk a lot about like the subconscious mind and how, you know, sometimes your subconscious comes up with the the ideas and you need, and this is a pretty common idea about like, you need to take a break so that your subconscious mind can work on that idea. Right. And then when you least expect it, it comes back in and it's like, oh, I solved the solution. Yeah. Or I solved the problem. Right. I I think um but but yeah I want to hear your butt because I I think I also agree with your butt. Yeah. The, like there is there is something good about crunch time. Yeah. There is something really good about that 3 a.m. still working in the studio. Yeah. And and you know I I probably need to become a little bit more familiar with uh with Paul's article and his mindset on this. But the thing that I often encounter is that I mean in a lot of the jobs that I work on or that I work at, it's not like I'm under crunch time on a weekly basis. Like there are deadlines that are a couple weeks away. And the, the difficulty with that can be that you don't feel kind of like the fire underneath you to yeah. make decisions. I, I think there is value to have fire underneath you. Yeah. And I have often found... and. And I don't know that this is a healthy thing, but I can even remember back to before I got into design. Um, this I was working at the college radio station at at Virginia Tech, and I was I just became a part of the promotions team, so like putting out flyers for shows okay. that the that the radio station was putting on, and they asked me to do some artwork for it. And at that time, wasn't in design school, but I had Illustrator, I had all that stuff, and so I was doing like vector art. And I I had like a, a like a night to do it, and I have to say like those moments and and I often think back to this moment as kind of like that first moment that I felt this. I I I hardly ever feel as invigorated as I do in those moments. Yeah, where it's like I just I need to do this, and I and I need to stop like thinking about it there's right. like no time to overthink exactly because i think that overthinking and too much time can also be to your detriment yeah um and there's there's just like setting that deadline and having that crunch time to push away all of the all the concerns all the questions and just get down to like the core of what needs to get done Sometimes I feel like crunch time is the only thing that can highlight those things. Yeah, I I do definitely resonate with that thought as well. I mean, you know, specifically my time management, I, you know, going from in-house designer to freelance, it's definitely a lot harder to manage your time. Right. You know, when you're in-house, it's like, oh, yeah, 9 to 5, easy. Yeah. 5 p.m., the clock's off. Like, yeah. do whatever you want. Yeah. You know, there's occasions where it's not, not the case, but most of the time it's pretty easy. But now being a freelancer, I do find myself occasionally struggling, occasionally yeah. having to stay up late to work on a project. Right. Um, I, I think I'm better at it than I was in school, like certainly. Um, I remember in school, I, I pulled maybe two all-nighters. Mm. Um, but still now as a professional, like I still get in situations where, you know, there's just a lot of, a lot of stuff to do. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, sometimes you do have to, ha- like, pull up your 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 bootstraps and buckle in and yeah. really just like power through. Yeah, I I I would hope that as I continue cuz I think that this is also a product of just the workaholic um, culture. Well, maybe a maybe a bit of that. Okay. 
But I also think that it's just a product of where you are at in your career. Mm. And I think crunch time is something that you probably experience a lot more often at the beginning of your career. Yeah. Because I can't say that I've pulled an all-nighter in a long time like i've definitely worked late have you ever pulled an all-nighter as a professional yes really i well so this is a very specific instance at quirky where everybody pulled an all-nighter because it was like an event oh okay i don't yeah so So, it was like a all-night event yeah it was it was a thing but it wasn't like it's an all-night event because we have a client deadline yeah uh, or is it just like hey we're doing a party it's an all-night event yeah it was it was like well, well, the whole thing was around the release of the new iPhone. And so the whole idea was like, we're going to design 10 cases mm. in one night okay. for like, I think it was for the iPhone 5. Yeah. Um, and so that was like the push was to like design, render, like photograph was all it, these things in one night. Was it a, a publicity thing or was it purely to just get design work out in it a night was, because the iPhone was released? It, it was a little bit of both. Okay. Um, I wonder if that... That's really interesting. I wonder Did you get if paid that extra? article... I, I was an intern at the time, <laughs> um, but huh. I don't know. Uh, I'm just like pulling up all these like quirky like iphone quirky quote unquote right. there's iPhone. a there's a there's a iphone case that looks like a hamburger <laughs> maybe if i put did you design the egg. hamburger iphone case james <laughs> i did not unfortunately james does like i would be i would be a shack. secret millionaire i just called that... it i just called it shake and shack <laughs> clearly i do not go there very yeah often. um so yeah it was it was an interesting experience i don't i can't recall a time since then that i've pulled on the liners, but i've definitely like worked late yeah Mm -hmm. um including last night because we had a presentation today at our at our joint job did you get to bed late i got to bed a little bit late how late you're texting me like 11 yeah i no i don't want to say okay but you can tell me off the pod but yeah it was it was like fairly late but i don't mind because the next day i'm often so like you know uh pushed by adrenaline like running yeah. on adrenaline that the lack of sleep and also like my sleep cycles typically are pretty good i i feel like if i have to stay up late once a month to finish something like i don't like that doesn't seem unhealthy to me I, i'm pretty sure that there's way more people that are stay up way later than you and are a lot less healthier than that yeah for sure i think you have a healthy lifestyle right so so but i think like i can remember back to being in school and I can remember, like, especially the first year of ID, like the first, like, the, which was the second year in my program, like pulling a lot of all-nighters. And in the foundations year, because you're just, you're just tr- figuring out so much and you're not aware yeah. of how long things take. Because it always takes twice as long as you think. And when you're a professional, the other thing that happens is that you get better at doing more work more efficiently yes or you know what to focus on and Mm -hmm. what not to focus on i think that's also a key point too is i think sometimes there's scenarios where you'll stay late and you'll work on something but also you know that you know maybe you have a presentation or you have a meeting and it's not like a like a drop dead like once you finish this project it's going to get it's going to cut tooling usually there's some sort of you know, when, when you're presenting concepts, when you have a deadline, it's to present a concept. Right. And after that concept's presented, there's usually a, a, a time for adjustment. Right. So, I yeah, I think like in school, you kind of feel like, oh, it needs to be perfect and it needs to be just exactly right. Right. Whereas in, in the real life, it's like, oh, it's okay if it's, if it's not exactly detailed out yet. You still have time to refine it and then send it to the manufacturer. Yeah. Not every scenario is like that, but I think a lot of times that there are deadlines it's for like a meeting or a presentation yeah but i i think that from what i've known of people who have worked at maybe some of the bigger studios like i've i've known i've heard stories about cultures like work cultures in which staying late working late is kind of like the norm and it and it's just always crunch yeah. time. And we've talked. I think we talked about this in a couple podcasts. Yeah, and I I, 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 d- I disagree with that culture. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. I, I can't say that I love the idea of that culture, but 
I don't know. I mean, I guess it gets some results, but I, I think there, yeah, there, there is a, it's a balancing act. I think, right. You have to balance that stress in that fire to get something done, you know, like that there, there is some like, I don't know, grit that comes with that. And I think there's some value in what comes out of that kind of yeah. stress. Uh, but I also think that doing it all the time is, is bad. Right. I, I, especially when companies put that on you to make you feel like, oh, I have to stay late because everyone else is staying late and working hard. I think that's bad. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I haven't, I haven't really thought too much about it. And I haven't been through that situation. Yeah. I know we we did have an episode about this where you're like, yeah. well, maybe you should work late because you do want to prove yourself and move up. I don't know. Yeah. Well, yeah. I, I think I think well, there's the whole like first in, last out thing, which right. I think can look can look good and can also give you face to face time with people that are higher up um, that you might not get if you're leaving like at a specific time before, you know, your manager leaves or the CEO leaves or whatever it is. Um, but I, I will say that like, you know, talking about quirky, there were parts of that experience that were so exhilarating because of that culture. Yeah. Like there, there's something also kind of intoxicating about a team of people who are like, we're staying late. We're really going to like, you know, kill this. We're going to knock it out of the park. We're going to do great work. Like when it's that team effort, that can be really exhilarating at the same time. Yeah. I, I wouldn't say I've ever had that experience as a professional, but definitely in school, I can, I resonate with that of like finals week, everyone's in the studio working hard. Yeah. You know, we're all just pumped on, you know, monster energy drinks and five hour <laughs> energy, you know, it's like, um, oh, man. There, there is some camaraderie and some friendships that are built out of those experiences. Oh, for yeah. Sure. It's like the closest thing that any of us have come to war if you <laughs> you haven't gone into the army or anything like that. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, that, that's a it's an interesting topic. And I feel like I could probably dive into it. Yeah. That, really deeply. Yeah. That was definitely a, a great question, Ezra. Ezra. And uh, I I think that's it for the I questions we're, we okay. talked a little long on that one but we i think it was, it was a good question though it was a really good question um if you have questions yourself email to minor details pod at gmail is it pod <laughs> i can't oh yes no it's minor details podcast at gmail.com yes our instagram is at minor details pod yes um i should really just that lack of consistency nick i, I really should just grab everything and just own it all own it oh i guess i have to do that now since i just said that Yep, you do. Okay. You've uh, just created work for yourself. It's yep. crunch time. It's due tomorrow. <laughs> uh, and our shout out of the week. Oh, the shout out of the week. We actually forgot about shout out of the week last week. Oh, man. Um, shout out of the week is a render artist called New Colossal. Yes. Who posted a, we found out from their post with the calculators on the Render Weekly Instagram. Yeah. Um, Talk about teenage teenage engineering, you know, inspired yeah, this this calculator render they did is like just the circuit board with some buttons applied. Yeah, which is really crazy. It's pretty awesome and so realistic. Yeah, the realism on this thing is amazing. It's insane. They they're using this calculator as like a keychain calculator, yeah. and they have the key here. It just looks like a normal like house key, and it's got like fingerprints and scratches oh and dust on it. It God. looks it looks just like a photo. It's crazy. The thing the thing that really sold me on them was their they're Pokemon balls. Yes, they have a Pokemon ball in this like, I don't know, Pelican type looking case. Oh, it's so nice. They got a little video of it with the lights and everything. It's just, it's very impressive. Um, Hyper realistic. Yeah, and it looks like they just posted a new one. Some some clear cartridges. Game cartridges. But yeah, um, so yeah, shout out, shout out to New Colossal. And thank you for <laughs> Render Weekly for exposing talent. Yeah. Um, and uh, pins? Pins. Buy some pins, guys. Pins. Pin them. Spin them. Spin them. Use them for pinups. Sp buy <laughs> buy yeah. 100 pins. I, we don't have and, that much stock. And but. you can use them to pin up your sketches. Yes. If you want to buy 100, email, email us directly because I don't, <laughs> don't, break, don't break the website, please. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. Thanks for tuning in, guys. Uh, give it a like on... on uh, YouTube, subscribe on iTunes, 
Give it five stars on iTunes. Yeah. Uh, Spotify. There's probably stars on Spotify too, right? Uh, are there reviews on Spotify? Are, is there? I don't know. Google I don't know. Play. You know, you know where we are. Our intro and outro is by the amazing Kiyoshi the Kid, as always. Um, and as always, I'm at Nick B. Baker. I'm at I Draw on Receipts. Peace out, guys. Later. You don't poke their eye out.